Tonight at 10, the first step is taken on the parliamentary journey towards Brexit. The eyes to the right, 498. The nose to the left, 114. An overwhelming majority in favour of the bill, allowing the government to start negotiating by the end of March. And Conservative MPs are overjoyed. What this shows is that we can go into this negotiation with some self-confidence and some ambition. And I think, you know, from my point of view, I do want to try and bridge some of the, the gaps and heal some of the wounds. But there were 114 against the bill, including 47 Labour MPs who defied their leader's orders. My constituency voted strongly to remain. And I think if we're going to connect Westminster back in with the community as the representative of York Central, I need to bring that voice back into Westminster. We'll have the latest on the vote and the reaction. Also tonight, President Trump's most significant announcement so far. Today I am keeping another promise to the American people by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch. He's the president's nominee for the Supreme Court, but Democrats say he's too hardline and unlikely to command confidence. Three generations of one family killed in a terror attack in Tunisia. The inquest hears from the grandson who survived. Why building new homes on Greenbelt land would ease the housing crisis, according to one of Britain's biggest builders. Nice view. Best seat in the house. And not everywhere is like the Emirates. The Premier League is told to stop making excuses about disability access at football grounds. In the South, hidden abuse. We hear from two women who say their concerns weren't taken seriously by police. And caught on camera, the father and son who spotted this driver breaking the law but weren't able to report it. Good evening. Members of Parliament at Westminster have taken the first step towards invoking Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, the start of the process of leaving the European Union. The House of Commons voted by an overwhelming majority, 498 to 114, in favour of the bill drawn up by ministers, and the parliamentary process is meant to be completed early next month. Among those who voted against were 47 Labour MPs who defied the orders of their leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has the latest. Feeling confident, Prime Minister? She didn't really need to worry. Having fought against having the vote, Government ministers never really worried about winning it. In the end, a much bigger proportion of MPs voted to begin Brexit than the proportion of us that chose to leave. The eyes to the right, 498. The nose to the left, 114. Huge cheers. But yes, that was one MP muttering suicide. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Dozens of Labour MPs voting against, but a thumping government majority. We can go into this negotiation with some self-confidence and some ambition. And I think, you know, from my point of view, I do want to try and bridge some of the, the gaps and heal some of the wounds. This is difficult uh, for the Labour Party. We are a pro-European internationalist party. Um, when we believe in cooperation and collaboration with other nations. George Osborne. <clears throat> but many voting yes did so with a heavy heart. The government has chosen, and I respect this decision, not to make the economy the priority in this negotiation. The European Union is not prioritising the economy either. We do not want to give the sense that people having voted for Brexit they felt they'd been ignored are being ignored once again. On a wet Wednesday, the debate didn't feel it's been about the country's destiny. But tonight, history hangs over. A quiet revolution, the Prime Minister called it. Brexiteers were proudly manning the barricades. For the first time in 40 years, the way British parliamentary democracy is meant to work will actually be able to work. This was a nationwide referendum of the British people, and the British people spoke. Does the Prime Minister know what she's doing? In the unlikely event, it was news to anyone. Our former top diplomat in Brussels, now out of his job, warned MPs today of bumpy times ahead. So, just is the government going to make a failure of Brexit? Fist fights, feisty talks, 
and potentially a bill of billions to get out of the European club. This is going to be, on a humongous scale, going to have enormous amounts of uh, business running up various different channels. The total fi financial liability, as they, as they see it, uh, might be in the order of 40 to 60 billion euros on exit. That prospect and principle means some Labour MPs have even quit the Commons' top team, rather than obey Jeremy Corbyn's order to vote for the bill. Several have sacrificed their front bench jobs, like Rachel Maskell, until tonight in the shadow cabinet. Not anymore, because she voted with her Remain constituents. You've made your decision on principle, but it is the Labour Party that looks divided tonight. Well, I think the, the Labour Party is absolutely solid now that we do not want a Theresa May Brexit, that we're going to be working towards ensuring the, the voices of people across the country are involved in the process as we go forward. The arguments don't end tonight. The Honourable Member, Right Honourable Member for Rushcliffe yesterday, compared it to Alice in Wonderland. But Alice only took herself into the hole. This Prime Minister is taking virtually all the Tory party, half the Labour party and the entire country into the hole. How then can anyone pretend that this undiscussed, unwritten, unnegotiated deal in any way has the backing of the British people? So the Prime Minister sweeps out. She has her way. Those against her seem lonely for now. And let's join Laura live in the Houses of Parliament. Laura, important to underline, it's a first parliamentary step today, but a very significant one. Yes, Hugh. I mean, there could be plenty of rocks in the road. Things could be very bumpy for the government in the months and years to come. You know, this is a small step, but a very, very significant step. Nonetheless, MPs for the first time approving the initial legal steps that will make real the biggest decision that the British voting public has made for decades. We are, if you like, now in the departure lounge on our way out of the European Union. There's so much that we could say after a debate that, you know, wasn't full of poetry, wasn't full of epic rhetoric, but is a really critical moment that people will look back on as being a real red letter day for this parliament for good or for ill and for me there are three things briefly that just stand out first of all for some time ministers have been saying to their critics we're beyond the point of no return we've passed that the people decided now after this very first vote that does feel absolutely the case that is the sense here in parliament even though there are plenty more obstacles not least the house of lords down the corridor behind me that could make things very difficult for the government second of all after years and years of Tory blood on the carpet in the House of Commons. It's Labour that is the party that is painfully divided over this issue tonight. Jeremy Corbyn's had front benchers quitting over it. There are people on the front bench still tonight who voted to defy his authority and it's not quite clear what he's going to do about that. And thirdly, really fascinatingly, after the referendum, Today, we've seen MPs voting for something, some of them, that they don't believe in because they felt at pains to put their constituents' views first. They felt under pressure to do so. And that's a real contrast to what normally happens here. We've had the binary black and white referendum sort of mashing up with a much more nuanced way that our parliamentary representation sometimes works. That's been very, very uncomfortable for, more, for many MPs, I have to say, and I think that is going Going to be a feature now of how people divide. They feel that urgency, they feel that pressure to represent their constituents, not necessarily in the best interest that they believe, but in how they voted, remain or leave. Laura, once again, thanks very much. Laura Kunzberg there for us with the latest uh, tonight at Westminster. Now, earlier this evening, President Trump's nominee for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, the former chief executive of the oil giant ExxonMobil, was finally confirmed in post by the Senate, but the process was not straightforward and Mr Tillerson was opposed by nearly every Democrat. Uh, the next major confirmation hearing will be for Judge Neil Gorsuch. He is Mr Trump's choice for the vacant position on the US Supreme Court. Leading Democrats are questioning whether he can be uh, an independent voice. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has more details. Forget the humdrum way a Supreme Court pick is normally announced. This is the Donald Trump White House, and it was all geared for primetime television. Every network taking the announcement live, tension building through the day. But now, it was showtime. So was that a surprise, was it? 
Politicians come and go, but Neil Gorsuch, a Conservative with impeccable legal credentials and flanked by his British wife, has just been handed a job for life to the most powerful court in the land. Standing here in a house of history and acutely aware of my own imperfections, I pledge that if I am confirmed, I will do all my powers permit to be a faithful servant of the Constitution and laws of this great country. Last night there were protests against his appointment outside the Supreme Court. This will become a political dogfight, for sure. Not least because the vacancy came up a year ago, but Republicans refused point-blank to even meet Barack Obama's nominee. Now Democrats are promising to be equally belligerent. I have very serious doubts that Judge Neil Gorsuch is up to the job. In the meantime, the Supreme Court nominee is on a charm offensive, touring the Capitol, glad-handing, offering reassurance. And Donald Trump is impatient to get things done quickly. He had this advice for the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. If we end up with the same gridlock that they've had in Washington for the last longer than eight years, in all fairness to President Obama, a lot longer than eight years. But if we end up with that gridlock, I would say, if you can, Mitch, go nuclear. The Supreme Court gets to vote on all the most contentious issues in American society. Gun control, abortion law, gay rights, and who knows, maybe soon, Donald Trump's controversial immigration ban. For many voting Republican last November, it wasn't about Donald Trump. He was a means to an end. The end being keeping the Supreme Court in conservative control. And it could become even more conservative. Two of the more liberal justices are now quite elderly. Justice Breyer is 78, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 83. If President Trump gets to choose their replacements, the political complexion of the Supreme Court will have changed dramatically. And that in turn could result in massive change to the social fabric of America. John Sokol, BBC News, Washington. Well, in the 12 days since he took the oath of office, President Trump's administration has issued dozens of orders, some of them sharply dividing opinion, but the president's supporters say he is simply fulfilling the promises that he made on the campaign trail, whether people like them or not. Our North America correspondent, Nick Bryant, has travelled to the southern state of Tennessee to see how people there are taking to the new president. The hills of eastern Tennessee... A landscape that reminds us that it wasn't just the Rust Belt that won Donald Trump the presidency, but the Bible Belt as well. Father God, we are so grateful to be able to meet here together. Chattanooga prides itself on being the buckle of that belt. And at this Bible study group this morning, praise for his socially conservative Supreme Court nominee. Amen. And thanks to God for placing him in the White House. God has done a work in him. He has changed him. You can just see it in the people he surrounds himself with. And um, I do believe he's brought a seriousness that people just didn't think were going to come out of Donald Trump. I think God led this country to put Donald Trump in office. I was uh, very opposed to him. Mark West started out as a never-Trump Republican. He's an evangelical Christian who looked upon the New Yorker as a philandering playboy. But he's become a convert. Those social conservatives and, uh, and conservatives in general have been so fed up with Washington for so long, for decades, that we wanted someone to go to Washington and blow it up. And whether I was a Trump supporter or not, so many of us are looking for Trump to do exactly what he has been doing so far, to completely change the landscape, blow up figuratively Washington, and give us a new American revolution. <laughs> It's been the pace of the Trump presidency. It's felt like a final furlong gallop that's impressed Kelly and Todd Floyd. We're excited to see what he will continue to do. You think he's making good in his promises? I think he is. I think the implementation of the uh, immigration policy uh, showed that he, you know, was not a career politician. But I think that's why he got voted into office is because we don't want career politicians anymore. There's no sign here of buyer's remorse. To travel from coastal cities like New York and Los Angeles into these heartland communities feels like crossing into a parallel universe. There are two Americas right now. And how you react to Donald Trump determines which one you inhabit. The cannons from the American Civil War that dot this landscape can be viewed both as relics of the past and reminders of how conflict and divisiveness is almost written into this nation's DNA. And once again, it feels like the people of America are sharing the same continent 
but not the same country. Nick Bryant, BBC News, Tennessee. Well, the Prime Minister has insisted that uh, she is not afraid to speak frankly to President Trump, confirmed that she considered his travel ban on seven mainly Muslim countries as divisive and wrong. Labour demanded to know whether Mrs May had been aware of the President's plans when she visited the White House last week. She said she hadn't been. Uh, and at the European Parliament, the former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, defended Mr Trump and accused EU leaders of anti-Americanism. Our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, has more details. Anger this week against that US travel ban on mainly Muslim countries. Anger too at Theresa May's hesitation before adding her voice to the criticism. But today the Prime Minister made her disapproval plain. We wouldn't do it in six years as Home Secretary. I never introduced such a policy. We believe it is divisive and wrong. They'd been friendly enough, hand in hand at one point, but she wasn't tipped off early about the travel ban, she said. Labour's leader wanted his invitation to a state visit cancelled. Just what more does the President Trump have to do before the Prime Minister will listen to the 1.8 million people who've already called for his state visit in invitation to be withdrawn? Theresa May wasn't giving way on that, just the opposite. Let's just see what he would have achieved in the last week. Would he have been able to protect British citizens from the impact of the executive order? No. Would he have been able to lay the foundations of a trade deal? No. Would he have got a 100% commitment to NATO? No. He can lead a protest. I'm leading a country. The attacks, the mockery of opponents calling her Teresa the appeaser, might have been blunted had she come down harder against the travel ban from the start. Getting close to Donald Trump and avoiding the odium that he attracts, it's a fine balancing act. It's a safe bet she'll have future opportunities to work on her balance. He doesn't mind hostile reviews. He's lying to you, was Labour MEP's Seb Dance's verdict on Nigel Farage, today again upsetting European leaders. Trump is motivated by protecting the United States of America from Islamic terrorism, whereas what has happened in this room and in governments around Europe is you have welcomed these people into your own homes. Here, MPs can only wait for the next cause to condemn or defend Donald Trump. No one expects a long wait. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. A coroner has praised the courage of a 16-year-old boy who tried to shield his grandfather from a gunman during the terror attack in Tunisia. Owen Richard survived, but his grandfather, brother and uncle were among 30 British people who were killed in Sousse back in 2015. Our correspondent, Daniela Ralph, reports now from the Royal Courts of Justice. For every family, these inquests are deeply upsetting. But for Suzanne Richards and her son Owen, their suffering has been unbearable. It was a holiday that tore a family apart. The trip to Tunisia was described as a jolly boy's outing. This photo taken on the flight there. Grandad Pat Evans, his grandson Joel and his son Adrian. The following day, they would all be killed. In a statement read to the court, the sole survivor of the group, Owen Richards, described how they all ran, trying to escape as they heard shooting. CCTV footage shows the gunman walking into the hotel, past the lifts. An animation shown to the inquest illustrates the route it's believed he took, into the indoor pool area, where he murdered three members of the same family. Owen Richards said he heard his brother shouting, no, 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 as the gunman attacked. He lay on the floor hugging his grandfather, but when he looked down, there was a gunshot wound. Pat Evans told his grandson, he got me. Owen then saw that his brother and his uncle had also been killed. In incredibly moving scenes in court, when Owen Richards' statement had been read, the coroner said, it seems to me that Owen acted with extraordinary courage in trying to protect his grandfather. Owen's mother, Suzanne, lost her eldest son, her brother and her dad. Today, she read tributes to them all and told the inquest, that fatal, horrific morning destroyed my family. We are broken and every day is a colossal struggle. 
She went on, I am determined to give Owen the best life I can. What this mother and son have been through is hard to imagine. As Suzanne Richards told the inquest today, how can four people go on holiday and only one come home? Daniela Ralph, BBC News, at the Royal Courts of Justice. Now, one of uh, Britain's biggest builders says that building on some greenbelt land would help to solve the housing crisis. Four million acres around major towns and cities in England are designated by local authorities as greenbelt. And the chief executive of Legal and General says that building on just a fraction of it would allow the government to meet house building targets. The Conservatives have pledged to build one million new homes in England by the year 2020. Last year, up until November that is, 190,000 had been added. A major announcement on house building is expected next week, as our economics editor Kamal Ahmed tells us. Britain's green and pleasant land. Precious to many and long controlled by a planning system that some criticise for putting the interests of not in my backyard ahead of those looking for somewhere affordable to live. For house builders, it's a debate we need to have. This is Crowthorne in Berkshire, a development by one of Britain's biggest house builders. For the chief executive reforming the Greenbelt, land close to towns and cities where people want to live is vital. The size of the Greenbelt has doubled in the last 20 years. It's 4 million acres right now. Even freeing up 1%, which is 40,000 acres, would create half a million to a million new homes. We've got to have a much greater critical assessment of what is green belt and what is brownfield sitting within the green belt. Britain's beautiful green belt. And not many people are arguing we should be building on fields like this. But let's just take a little walk about 200 metres up this track. Well, you get here. Still green belt, but very different. And it's these type of areas that housing developers say could be used for building new homes. Campaigners argue start unravelling the green belt and valuable countryside will be lost. How do you respond to the critics who say that really we're too precious about the green belt and that frankly a lot of the green belt isn't that green? Well look, it's the countryside near where people live. It's, we're an incredibly crowded country. We've stopped towns merging into each other. And this is a hugely important resource for, for people and for nature and for the whole country, really. Pressure on the Greenbelt is growing. In 2012, there were proposals to build 81,000 homes on Greenbelt land in England. By 2016, that figure had risen to 275,000. This year, the rise is even steeper, 360,000 applications, a record increase. For England, read Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, where clashes over Greenbelt have caused local controversies. Barking in East London. Not a lot here yet, but this is a site run by L&Q Housing Association, a charity which builds houses for purchase and rent. Some people are calling this Barcelona on Thames. And so its leader says yes, release more land, but there are other options. How about more of that rather old-fashioned idea, council houses? There is so much to do that we don't have to put all of our eggs in the housing association basket or the house builder basket. We all have a role to play. If local authorities had been able to build as we can over the last three decades, we'd be talking about the housing crisis in the past tense. Later this month, the government is set to announce its plans to revolutionise house building in England. Planning laws could change. Expect more government-backed house building. This green and pleasant land needs to provide affordable homes for all. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. Let's have a, a brief look at some of the day's other news stories. Officials in Germany say they have evidence that Islamists were preparing a terror attack in the country. More than a thousand police officers raided dozens of properties in the state of Hessen this morning. A 36-year-old Tunisian man who was suspected of recruiting for the Islamic State group was detained. A new trial to reform rail fares will begin in May after train operators admitted that buying the right ticket could be baffling. The system will make sure that passengers pay the cheapest possible fares and avoid the need to split their tickets on longer journeys. A former teacher has pleaded guilty to more than 40 charges of abusing children, both in Britain and overseas. Mark Frost, who's 70, pleaded guilty at the Old Bailey to offences including rape, indecent assault and making obscene images. Prosecutors said the case was one of the most serious they dealt with. 
Now, a year since the World Health Organization declared Zika a global emergency, scientists are now beginning to understand how it affects children. The mosquito-borne virus has caused almost 2,500 babies uh, in Brazil to be born with microcephaly, that is a condition identified by an abnormally small head. And doctors now believe that that number could be much higher, with thousands of other infants showing signs that they too have health complications related to the virus, despite not having microcephaly. Our correspondent Camila Costa reports from uh, Recife in Brazil, where the outbreak first began. This is Zika's devastating consequence. These babies will need help for the rest of their lives. Here is the best place for them to get the specialist care they need. But there isn't enough money to help all of them. One of those on the waiting list is José Wesley. He became the face of Zika after this photo went viral. A year later, José is still very small for his age. He has breathing difficulties, trouble swallowing and can't walk. The only way his mother can feed him is through a tube. I come here three times a week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays. I wake up at four in the morning and arrive here at six because there is no other transport available. Then I wait for the doctor. It's very difficult, but it's not impossible. If it's for my baby's health, nothing is impossible. A year after Zika was declared a global emergency, doctors believe the number of babies affected could be much higher. I'm with baby Mirella Vitoria. She's 15 months old and she is one of those cases the doctors are studying right now. She wasn't born with microcephaly, but later on she showed signs that she too was affected by the Zika virus in her mother's womb. Her mother, Mihleni, thought she had escaped Zika's devastating impact. But after a few months, something didn't seem right. When the doctor said it was Zika, I was really surprised, but also relieved, because I had noticed she had motor problems. I wondered why she wasn't developing like other kids. So from then on, I knew I was wrong and could treat her with physiotherapy and stimulation. They call it congenital Zika syndrome. Even if these babies are born with a normal-sized head, they can have poor vision, hearing loss, and other disabilities later in their lives. Research shows that for every baby with microcephaly, 10 others might develop these problems. We still have a lot to learn, but we already know that the microcephaly is just the tip of the iceberg. We expect to determine the risk of early and late symptoms related to this syndrome. Mirella is now getting the help she needs. Doctors are rushing to identify the thousands of babies like her who will also require treatment. But the Brazilian health system is already struggling to cope with Zika's legacy. Camila Costa, BBC News, Recife. Well, the Premier League has been told by the Equality and Human Rights Commission to stop making excuses after publishing its interim report on disability access at football grounds. Several Premier League clubs are missing their targets for improving stadium access for disabled fans. Our sports correspondent, Katie Gornell, has the story. I got my first season ticket at Highbury in 1990. Following Arsenal is Anthony's passion. This is a trip he makes most weeks. When he's here, he feels just like any other fan. This is it here. Away from home, it's been a different story. This is how it should be. Three years ago, Anthony was part of a BBC investigation into disabled access in the Premier League. We revealed a number of issues. Away fans being made to sit in the home end, poor sight lines, while the vast majority of clubs failed to provide enough wheelchair spaces. Just because you can't walk or stand or see doesn't make you any more less of a fan than someone who can do those things. Um, and too often, uh, disabled people tell me they don't have a good experience when they go to football grounds. And three, four years on, that's still not right. After years of complaints, the Premier League committed that all clubs would reach minimum access standards by the start of next season. Recently promoted teams have an extra year to comply, but there are fears that at least three clubs will miss the deadline. Bournemouth say they face challenges because they don't own their stadium, while Watford insist they're at a point where all known demand from disabled supporters has been met. 
and Chelsea have stated they won't fully meet the guidelines until they develop a new ground. For years, the constraints of Old Stadia, like Stamford Bridge here at Chelsea, has been offered up as a reason for clubs failing to meet accessibility guidelines. But today's extensive report from the Premier League doesn't draw any conclusions on that. It does, however, show that an awful lot of progress has been made in this area. However, for some, it's still not enough. And the Equality and Human Rights Commission says there'll be consequences. For those clubs where they are not meeting the responsibilities under the Equalities Act, the Commission can and will take legal action against those clubs. But the Premier League says rapid progress has been made and several clubs, including Manchester United, are undertaking major structural work to improve access. For campaigners, it can't come soon enough. It's absolutely wrong that young people with disabilities haven't been to their home stadiums to see their team. It's absolutely wrong at any level um, and that needs sorting and it can't go on and it shouldn't. Right now the wait goes on for the right results, but there is hope on the horizon. Katie Gornall, BBC News. Quick reminder, the news night's about to start on BBC Two. Here's Evan. We're going to be hearing from one of the women who resigned from Labour's front bench team tonight in order to defy the referendum result and vote against Brexit. What is her message to the public? Join me now on BBC Two. That is Newsnight with Evan here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.